language itself is being demeaned in this whole question of the nuclear arms race. I am very concerned with language. Language is my, is my life, my profession, my vocation. And when I read words such as Megadeth, Megadeth, and Overkill, how can there be overkill? We can only die once. Megadeth is an obscene word. When you think that it refers glibly to the death of countless millions upon millions upon millions of living human beings, women, children, and men, real people, I've had people say to me from time to time, people who oppose the peace groups, well, of course, you women are just getting all emotional about this issue. And I say, if I can't get emotional over the fact that my children's lives are threatened, and by an extension of imagination, I conceive of all children in that sense to be my children. If I can't get emotional over that in God's name, what can I get emotional about? It's just the most important issue in the whole world. Of course it's emotional. My generation was the first in human history to come into young adulthood with the knowledge that mankind now had the terrifying power to destroy all life on Earth. I still remember, and I was a young woman at college at the time, when the bomb fell on Hiroshima and then a few days later on Nagasaki. And I remember discussing this with all the, my friends, my colleagues, and we realized that the world would never be the same again. I have been concerned about the whole issue of peace since that time. And I was particularly influenced when my children were very little They've been growing up now for some years. We lived in Vancouver. And when my daughter was, I think, in grade one, she brought home a form one day that had been passed out to all the school children, saying, in case of a nuclear attack, if the child's parents cannot be found, put down the next of kin. And I was so angry. Next of kin, indeed. I used that episode in my novel, The Fire Dwellers where one of Stacy's children comes home with the same form and she puts down next of kin, God, address, heaven, as if anybody on this earth could be found in the case of a nuclear attack. I've been quite active in the peace movement ever since that time. I think it is a moral responsibility and I think it is the most important moral and spiritual and practical issue of our times. If we do not solve this one, there isn't going to be anyone around to solve any of the other issues. And at the same time, I can't divorce this issue from the whole question of starvation, disease, all these things, hardships and sufferings that go on in so many parts of the world. When I consider the fact that for the price of one, Trident nuclear submarine, malaria could be wiped off the face of the earth. That gives me pause to think. I lived for a number of years in Africa. When my children were babies, both of them had malaria. They lived because they had good medical treatment. Thousands of children die every year. How can we be building nuclear weapons and seeing this go on at the same time? I think these two issues, the whole one of needless suffering in the world and the building of nuclear weapons are very closely tied together. One very great problem in terms of the nuclear arms race is what I would call a crisis of the imagination. It seems to me that a lot of the world's leaders, particularly the leaders in the two great superpowers, don't seem to have any imagination. They can talk about mega death, they can talk about 
200 million people being killed just like that. And it doesn't seem to enter their consciousness that these are real, live human beings that they're talking about. Our children, real people, who in a nuclear holocaust would die horribly. It is so terrifying to think about it that I think that particularly the militarists have distanced themselves from the fact that these they're talking about human beings. To them, they're talking about statistics. When I'm writing a novel, I have to try to feel the reality of my characters. I have to feel that they are as real as I am, that their joys and pain are as real as mine. I think that this is one great problem with the whole world today, and I suppose it always has been, that so many people have a limited view of reality. In other words, other people are not as real as they themselves. And this whole viewpoint of not being able to understand and feel the reality of others is what enables people to become so brutalized that they are able to torture and murder their fellow human beings. I have often written about characters who are described as ordinary people. My viewpoint is that there are no ordinary people. All people, in some way or other, are extraordinary. In this sense, I think that ordinary people, so-called ordinary people everywhere, can indeed have an effect in terms of halting the nuclear arms race. If we think, yeah, but I'm just an ordinary person, an ordinary housewife, an ordinary whatever, and I can't do anything. One person by themselves can't do anything. It's only by joining our voices together that we can, and knowing that none of us are ordinary. We are all unique human individuals who matter. And everyone who bears witness in this way, I think, can make a difference. It's very difficult for the artist these days. One is very tempted to address the issue of nuclear weapons directly through one's, in my case, fiction. I find that very hard. I think that what I find easier and in a sense more possible, is to address the issue in writing articles, in writing um, talks, lectures, and so on. And in that way, both as a writer and as a citizen, I can, ad ad address, the, I can address the issue directly. I do think that artists cannot really say write uh, in novels what I would call didactic prose. In other words, I cannot write novels that preach, but what I can do is to affirm my whole life view through the characters in my books. And I think that in all my writing, a very strong um, kind of celebration of life itself comes through. <laughs>